The next item of business is consideration of business motion 2071 in the name of Graeme Day on behalf of the Parliament Bureau setting out revisions to this week's business. Can I ask any member who wishes to speak against the motion uh, to press the request to speak buttons now? And nobody's objected. So I call on Graeme Day to move the motion. Uh, moved, presiding officer. As no member, as I said, is asked to speak against the motion. Therefore, the, the question is that motion uh, 2071 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed. The next item of business is topical questions. In order, and many people in this possible, and I know this is a hot topic, quite rightly, I prefer short and succinct questions and answers to match, please. Uh, number one, topical question, Alec Cole Hamilton, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what plans it has for the leadership of NHS Lothian in light of the recent resignation of its chairman and forthcoming retirement of its chief executive. Cabinet Secretary Jean Freeman. Arrangements for an interim chair for NHS Lothian are underway and will be announced shortly. We will work closely with NHS Lothian around the recruitment of a new chief executive with the aim of appointing the new chief executive before the current chief executive retires later this year. Alec Cole Hamilton. I'm grateful for that answer. NHS Lothian is in crisis. We have a sick kids hospital with no sick kids, repayments standing at £1.4 million every month. Elsewhere, we're seeing patients waiting more than a year to be discharged and children waiting up to two years for first-line mental health treatment. How does the Cabinet Secretary intend to mitigate the leadership vacuum and organisational memory loss in NHS Lothian Health Board? Cabinet Secretary. So let me first of all say that whilst I accept that NHS Lothian undoubtedly faces challenges, that's why, of course, it is at level four in our escalation ladder and that brings significant government support to it, I do not accept that the board is in crisis and I don't think that kind of language is particularly helpful or supportive to the many NHS Lothian staff who are working hard every single day. Of course, we can't forget that the current chief executive, who has considerable experience, uh, remains with us for uh, some time to come uh, and undoubtedly will be making sure, uh, as good leaders do, that uh, the organisational uh, memory and experience that he carries is passed on uh, to his senior team, some of whom uh, also have significant experience with NHS Lothian and all of them uh, elsewhere in our health service. Uh, we will make sure, of course, that uh, any new uh, chief executive uh, is properly experienced, meets the standards uh, of leadership, experience and expertise that we require uh, for our NHS boards, uh, and similarly, although in a different role, for the chair. And in all of those ways, including the significant uh, government funding and support being offered to this board as to others, uh, we will ensure that they are able to meet those challenges and continue in the improvement areas that we require them to do. Alec Cole Can I assure the Cabinet Secretary that I hold the staff of NHS Lothian in the highest regard and it is in their interest that opposition members ask questions like this. In resigning, Brian Houston said that there is a blame culture in the NHS and that NHS Lothian had not been treated with the values of openness and honesty, dignity and respect by some aspects of Scottish Government. This is not the first time that we have had a breakdown in the relationship and communications between the Government and the Health Board. We saw it in the Q EUH2. And in Tayside, the chairman quit just a month after being appointed by this health secretary. Numerous boards are in special measures. Does any of the fault lie at your door, Cabinet Secretary? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, the short answer to, answer to that is no, I don't believe it does. What I believe lies at my door is the responsibility that I am taking to ensure that our boards, including their leadership, uh, rise to the challenges that uh, they face and are supported properly and appropriately by the Scottish Government. I would remind uh, Mr Cole Hamilton that the chair of NHS Tayside resigning had nothing to do with how that board was performing or not performing, uh, nothing to do at all with the government or our interaction with them, but had to do with his promotion in terms of his academic career. So I think we need to be very careful in how we uh, deal with these. Of course, opposition members are, are and should challenge what as a government we do in health or in any other matter. But I would also uh, remind Mr Cole Hamilton of what the Star report said in terms of the value-based culture that should exist in our health service, that it relies not only on openness and honesty, dignity and respect, 
but also on humility, responsibility, accountability and self-discipline. With those in mind, I do reject that particular view expressed by Mr Houston. Now, quite a lot of members want to get in here, and I want to get in many in as possible, so I must ask for short questions, please. That will be um, Miles Briggs, followed by Monica Lennon, please. Thank you, Deputy President Officer. Senior Management in NHS Lothian have expressed concerns to MSPs regarding the timescale which the Cabinet Secretary has outlined for the opening of the new sick kids of autumn 2020. Can she outline, is this some of the fundamental differences that the retiring chairman outlined with the Cabinet Secretary? And will ministers take responsibility if this timescale slips once more? Cabinet Secretary. So the timescale um, for opening of the new sick kids hospital, which I'd remind members I closed because it was not safe for patients or staff, is a timescale that was reached following consultation with NHS Lothian Board, who remain a member of the Oversight Board uh, that is led by Scottish Government and charged with ensuring that all the work that needs to be done to ensure that the site is safe and meets the appropriate standards. So NHS Lothian have been actively involved, including their senior team. I'm not sure what concerns have been expressed to MSPs. I'm very happy to look at those if they're raised with me. Uh, the current uh, programme remains on time to meet uh, the timescale that I set out. Uh, that is the timescale that I require, and if there are uh, difficulties or problems with that in any respect at any point, I will, of course, return to the Chamber and inform members. Monica Lennon, followed by Alison Johnson. Thank you. If I can return to Brian Houston's resignation letter, because he paints a pretty, pretty bleak picture when he says that the behaviours shown by the Scottish Government totally counter, are totally counter to a values-based culture. The Cabinet Secretary has said that the Scottish Government is providing support to the Health Board, but we've got a bit of a contrast between what the outgoing chair is saying and what government officials are telling the Cabinet Secretary. Is it really a case, Cabinet Secretary, that there's nothing to see here, or can you advise what steps are being taken to look into Mr Houston's claims and to give not just MSPs, but the workforce and the families and patients some reassurance? Cabinet Secretary. So Mr Houston is, of course, entitled to his views. They're not views that I share. Uh, he and I have had uh, more than one conversation on this matter. Uh, the board itself has been in discussion uh, with the, through the chief executive with the DG uh, of uh, NHS Scotland. Uh, and uh, as I said, there are, uh, as Mr Houston rightly says, a difference of views. Uh, that does not mean uh, either that Mr Houston is, is entirely right or that I am entirely right. But I am not prepared to rehearse in public the conversations that I rightly have with all the chairs, individually and collectively, on our, of our NHS boards, which need to be, in some, in some respects, confidential in order for those conversations to be as frank and open as I know you would hope they would be. So I have no intention of going through point by point what Mr Houston has expressed as his views. Suffice it to say, he has resigned, I have accepted his resignation, and plans are, are in process now to appoint an interim chair for NHS Lothian and begin the formal appointment process through the public appointments procedure for a full-time chair. Alison Johnson, followed by Neil Finlay. Does the Cabinet Secretary consider that the NRAC formula, which resulted in NHS Lothian being £11.6 million short of its funding target for 2019, has placed extra pressure on the Health Board, which serves the fastest growing part of Scotland? Cabinet Secretary. So NHS Lothian's budget for this year, uh, in the, well, for the period since 2006 to 2007 uh, until now, uh, has risen by 31% above inflation uh, compared to territorial boards as a whole, uh, where their budget rose 21% above inflation. In addition, NHS Lothian in this financial year uh, has received uh, uh, the highest uplift of any territorial board and 16% of our waiting times money, an additional uh, share in terms of winter pressures and other matters. So NHS Lothian faces financial challenges, as do all our boards. They are different in Lothian. Uh, than they may be for some of the other boards, but that does not make them necessarily any harder. All boards uh, have to meet those challenges. NHS Lothian is part of that. Uh, we are moving and have moved so that we have 
all boards within 0.8% uh, of parity. Uh, would I like to do more? Yes, I would. Uh, but of course, if the uh, UK government hadn't cut the Scottish budget by as much as it has over these many years, then NHS and our health service would be receiving more funding. As it is, we receive the highest proportion of funding uh, for all portfolios in Scottish government. Neil Finlay, followed by Daniel Johnson. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary uh, allegedly told the uh, outgoing chair to accept accountability. With 1,300 drugs death, the mental health crisis, social care delays, waiting times targets being breached hundreds of thousands of times, bed blocking on an industrial scale and a budget crisis, which of these issues does the Cabinet Secretary accept responsibility for? And, uh, uh, and why has she put the two biggest health boards in special measures if there's no crisis? Cabinet Secretary. So, I am not going to, as I said before, get into a debate and a discussion about what Mr Houston, about what Mr Houston has said and what my response is to that. I think that's entirely inappropriate in a public forum. Um, it is for Mr Houston uh, to uh, uh, take his own view and to decide, uh, as he uh, appears to have done, that that view should be public, but it's not something I'm going to engage in. In terms of accountability, well, of course, Mr Finlay, as the Cabinet Secretary for Health, I am accountable for how our health service performs and for all the steps that need to be taken to ensure that that performance improves. And I think that is precisely what I'm doing. Can I just say again, shouting at me from the back is really not going to assist any mature, grown-up, conversation. It would be nice to have one with you, Mr Finlay, one of these days, yeah. mature, grown-up conversation about health. Of course, I accept accountability as the Cabinet Secretary, and I expect that accountability to be accepted by leaders across our health service. I think that is entirely right, entirely appropriate, and in accordance with the Sturrock Report. Daniel Johnson, followed by Sarah Boyer. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Cabinet Secretary's refusal to explain the, the resignation quite simply isn't good enough. We have a health board which is in special measures, a hospital costing £1.4 million a month which cannot open. It is in the public interest to understand what this fundamental difference of opinion is. Will the Cabinet Secretary now take the opportunity to explain to the public why the Chair has resigned? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, no, I won't. Uh, Mr Johnson, because, uh, as I said, I am not going to get in to a public tit-for-tat debate with Mr Houston about what he put in his resignation letter. I think that is entirely inappropriate to do so. My view as a Cabinet Secretary is that I expect leadership across our NHS to accept proper accountability for the failures and the decisions and the actions and the performance of individual boards, just as I accept accountability overall for how our NHS is performing. If an individual leader does not accept that accountability, does not agree with me that that is part of their role, clearly set out as their role as chairs, clearly exercised elsewhere in our health service, then that is a situation where we are not going to productively continue to work together. Other than that, there is nothing more I intend to say about this resignation. I have accepted it. I have now set and train uh, procedures to appoint an interim chair and to engage the public appointment process for a chair. Meanwhile, I will focus on what is the important matters, which is the improvement in performance of NHS Lothian and our other boards on waiting times, on cancer targets, on mental health targets, and in the case of NHS Lothian, making sure that thanks to our intervention, they will open a new hospital that is safe for patients, staff, and all of those who attend. Sarah Boyack. Cabinet Secretary, this is our parliament, and in your last two answers, you do say that you support accountability, but you are not prepared to explore the explanation of the fundamental differences between the chair of our health board and yourself. Surely this goes to the heart of accountability Absolutely. between the cabinet secretary, our health boards underfunding and the crisis measures that have been imposed across several of our health boards across Scotland. Surely this is something that, that we need a proper answer to and Cab we need it today. Cabinet secretary. 
Well, I, other short uh, presiding officer of repeating what I've already said. Uh, there is nothing more to say to that question. I am not prepared. I am not prepared. I think it's entirely inappropriate. I think it would damage the relationship that I have with chairs and chief executives across our health boards if I uh, ensured that there was a public discussion about confidential matters that are between me and those individuals in the meetings that we have. If an individual chooses to make those confidential discussions public, that is their decision, but that does not require me, nor would it be right for me, in terms of the relationship I have with other boards across our NHS, to engage in my version of those events. Thank you very much. And I move on to question two. Murdo Fraser, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what impact there will be on the economy and public finances of the downwards revision of estimated GDP from 180 to 175 billion. Cabinet Secretary Derek McCann. A nominal GDP is an estimate of the total cash value of all goods and services produced in the economy. The downward revision to this total for Scotland relates primarily to changes in the estimates of economic contribution of North Sea oil. And this reflects revisions by the ONS, which were published in December 2019 and are used by the Scottish Government statisticians to inform the quarterly national accounts estimates for Scotland. Therefore, revisions to the nominal value of GDP are a routine occurrence and have no impact on the real economy, household incomes or government revenues. Mar Mar Can I th thank the Cabinet Secretary for his response. There is, of course, a connection between GDP growth, income tax growth and the amount of money that the Scottish Government has to spend. We learned last week that for the most recent four quarters, growth in the Scottish economy was 0.6%, whilst the UK economy grew in the same period at 1.3%, more than double the Scottish rate. How does, how does the Scottish Government account for this difference in performance? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I see that uh, Murdo Fraser has changed the, the subject from his uh, ludicrous positioning over the last couple of days when the GDP revisions came out, where... Murdo Fraser was accusing me of hiding these statistics. So first of all, if we can stick to transparency for a moment, don't take my word for it, uh, Mr. Fraser. The Fraser of Allender Institute has said, suggesting that statistics have been buried to hide questions about Scotland's fiscal deficit is simply bizarre. There will, of course, be an important debate to be had about Scotland's relative fiscal position, but this should only take place when all revisions, not just to GDP, but the underlying public finances, are published in the annual GERS report in the summer, as the Fraser of Allender Institute on the 3rd of February 2020. So it's just interesting that Murdo Fraser has uh, revised his positioning in terms of GDP stats. There are some quarters where, of course, Scottish growth will have been higher uh, than UK uh, quarter. Uh, we are investing, of course, in our economy in growth. If you look at economic performance, uh, we are uh, in growth. I remember when the Tories were saying we'll be in recession. But in fact, if we get to a no-deal Brexit, then all economists are pointing to evidence that shows we, we, we will indeed be in recession. On exports, we are um, exceeding uh, other nations within the UK. On attractiveness, we're second only to London in the southeast of England. On productivity, we've had more gains uh, than... Uh, the rest of the UK. So actually we have a strong economic performance, we've got strong economic uh, foundations and of course we could do much more if we indeed were an independent country and hadn't have faced the Brexit that's being forced upon us by this UK government totally disrespecting the people of Scotland. And finally, presiding officer, I think you're also aware that I've launched an economic action plan that is a range of actions to help grow our economy in the face of UK government intransigence. Now, can I say to both the front bench and members, I want shorter questions. I certainly want shorter answers because I've got people wanting to get in and I want to get them all in. Mr. Friesen, don't chunter when you've had a one question. She were getting another one. That's you now. Is the Cabinet Secretary reading out a pre-prepared answer to a question I didn't ask and totally ignoring the question I did ask, which there was no answer to in five minutes of a irrelevant waffle that we've just heard? Anyway, let me try another question, if you can answer my last one. Scotland's notional deficit now stands at £12.6 billion, or 7.2% of GDP, the highest in Europe and well above the EU maximum of 3%. 
An independent Scotland, which the Cabinet Secretary referred to, would face eye-watering austerity as a result. So, where can the Cabinet Secretary tell us would the cuts fall if he had his way? Cabinet Secretary. You see, my forecasts are so good, I knew Murdo Fraser would go with his question, which is exactly why I put out the information that I've done, which incidentally was in response to the question that was put in the order of business. So I think it's entirely appropriate uh, I respond to that. Uh, all I can say uh, to Murdo Fraser is earlier in my answer, I quoted the Fraser of Allender. Institute. And let's just say I'll take their opinions more than I'll take the Fraser of Bluff and Bluster, uh, Murdo Fraser, in terms of his economic analysis, where the, the, the arithmetic isn't very good and neither is the political positioning either. Actually, Scotland's current estimated notional deficit is as a consequence of our current constitutional position, not we could do with independence where austerity is the price of the union, not independence. And we could, of course, grow our economy and spend more on our public services if we had the levers of control that most normal nations have, rather be bound by things like a migration policy that doesn't suit our economic needs in our country. Something, just one example of where the business community agrees with this government. So it is the case we could do much better with all the levers of independence so resisted by the Tories, who of course will welcome the fact that the polls for independence are now at 51% in favour. Now, I really must try. I'll try again for shorter questions and shorter answers. I live in hope, Mr Rennie. I know you won't disappoint me. Willie Rennie. Thank you, Deputy President Officer. Um, surely he should show some scintilla of embarrassment that he's actually in the context of the debate about the Constitution and about Brexit, that he is not open about these figures. There should be a proper debate in that context so that we can all understand the state of Scotland's finances and what future we would like for our country. Is he not a little bit embarrassed about that? Cabinet Secretary, no, I'm just briefly. embarrassed by Willie Rennie, who clearly hasn't read the documents or understands the position I've set out. In terms of the figures being sent out in a transparent fashion, and I saw that with some of the, the press coverage from those that are saying that Scotland's too poor and too wee to be independent, the kind of things that the Liberals say now alongside with the Tories. Actually, in terms of transparency, uh, these figures were published proactively. They were published as part of a published timescale uh, of and timetable of uh, reports that follows from the UK's ONS that feeds into our... Uh, Willie Rennie's shaking his head. These are facts. This is true. These are independent statisticians who produce these stats. The problem is is with opposition members who misinterpret them to try and undermine the economic strengths of their own country. That's what I find embarrassing. Richard Lyle, followed by Dean Lockhart. Thank you, President Officer. Yes, Cabinet Secretary, you should give them all a calculator. The latest export statistics released by the Scottish Government showed that Scotland's exports to the European Union grew at a faster rate than to those to the rest of the UK or to other international markets. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree that leaving the EU will make it more difficult for Scotland to reach our target of international exports being 25% of GDP by 2029? Cabinet Secretary. Well, yes, first of all, Richard Lyle is correct to uh, showcase that economic indicator that shows how Scotland is outperforming the rest of the UK in terms of exports. But any form of Brexit will make it harder for Scotland to export, uh, involving the loss of not just the access to the single market, but also loss of access to the raft of preferential trade agreements, which the EU has concluded with third countries, which our exporters currently benefit from. Even a free trade agreement of the firm that the UK government has stated it would like to pursue would result in GDP being 6.1% lower, and that's equivalent to £1,600 per person. Dean Lockhart, briefly, please. Thank you, Deputy President. Officer, in his answer, the Cabinet Secretary referred to North Sea oil. The oil price today is below $55 a barrel, and that's less than half the price the SNP forecast in the white paper on independence. Will the Cabinet Secretary now acknowledge that he and his colleagues got it fundamentally wrong in the white paper? 
Cabinet well, Secretary. Well, I mean, the Scottish Government said, of course, we are updating the case for independence, but Dean Lockhart, like all the other Conservatives and most other unionists, haven't even read the Growth Commission, which actually covered the position. The Commission's forecasts do not include North Sea revenue, which could, of course, be invested in the Scottish economy, supporting both future generations and providing an immediate economic boost. So you need to Get with it, Mr Lockhart. You need to le read the current economic analysis. You need to read those documents. And I know that the unionist argument is now performing so badly that you're back to saying that Scotland can't afford to be an independent country. The question really is that Scotland cannot afford to be part of this failing union. Rhoda Grant. The urgent questions that need to be addressed is why our GDP deficit is 7.2% and the rest of the UK is 1.1%. The Scottish Government has levers at its hand to grow our economy, but it won't use them for the benefit of the, the whole of Scotland. What yeah. is their industrial strategy? How are they going to deal with this deficit? Cabinet Secretary, Well, we are using our economic devolved powers uh, to the full to stimulate the economy and support our public sector and have a fair and progressive tax system. See, what the Growth Commission, what the evidence is, when we look at those countries that are outperforming Scotland, the only thing that they've got that we've not got is independence. That is the big tool that would allow for the change in our fiscal position. And recognise, if Rhoda Grant understands this figure, the estimated notional deficit is not the projection of an independent Scotland. It is a reflection, an estimate on the current constitutional position. It's a reflection of the union, not independence. And the sooner unionists educate themselves on this matter, the better. Thank you. That concludes topical questions. And there will be a short pause before we move on to the next item of business.